Hey guys, welcome to BP, the Bible Perspective. Is Corey Miner secretly preaching Calvinism? Now, before we get into it, please like and share this video and subscribe to BP, the Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome. I want to do a video, a friendly critique on a Corey Miner's, uh, who is of the Smart Christian channel, uh, of a video he did where he asked the question or he made the statement don't take credit for your salvation. Now, in the message, it seems that there's a lot of Calvinism that's embedded in his message. I want to kind of unpack that. Now, before we do, let's first understand what Calvinism is so that you can we can know what to look for. And this is what kind of grabbed my attention. Now, the doctrines of Calvinism is also known as the Reformed Theology also predestination. Uh, it, it, it dates back to like the 15th century, so it's been around for a while. And it is held by some of the most notable Christian leaders since that time, even to the present day. Now, for that reason, I think there are people who are on the other side that's intimidated by Calvinism. And if you ask them directly, do you believe in some of the points of Calvinism? they sort of shy away from giving a very firm answer. I have no problem saying that I believe that Calvinism, as it is held, some of the beliefs, is one of the most despicable doctrines ever because it totally misrepresents and mischaracterizes what God and how God has presented himself in Scripture, and that is the main problem. Now, there, Calvinism is broken up into five points called TULIP. The T in TULIP is total depravity. Now, total depravity means that you're hopelessly lost in your sins with no hope or inability to save yourself, come to salvation, and that we agree. But the problem is they also say you cannot do any good. You cannot, you can only will to do evil until God saves you, which is, again, utter nonsense. There are plenty of people who do good. Balaam, the false prophet, is an example how God used a false prophet to give the word of the Lord and then turn around and judge them. So you can't say that he couldn't, he, he couldn't do any good because he did good when he made his prophecy. Now, the you in Tulip is Unconditional election. Now, the U and the L are the most objectionable. Basically, unconditional election teaches that before the world began, God already made his choice as to who would be saved and who would be damned. If you just think about that, it opens up a whole lot of like, what, what, that doesn't make sense. That God already made his choice. So, Hip, hip, hooray if you're chosen. Good for you. But if you're not chosen, whoa, because you have no hope of eternal life, no hope of salvation, no appeal to mercy. You are damned simply because God didn't choose you. Now, the L in TULIP, is limited atonement. So since since Jesus only well, put like limited atonement is Jesus only dying for the chosen. Now, if you're not chosen, then the blood of Jesus Christ has absolutely nothing to do with you. Again, remember you have no hope. So Jesus only died for those whom He chose before the foundation of the world. Then there is irresistible grace. So because God chose you, then he draws you by your grace. Then you come irresistibly. All right. We'll see some of these elements in Corey's message. The P in TULIP is perseverance of the saints, meaning that you're going to persevere. You will never lose your salvation. And I don't particularly understand, but okay. Now, I want to show you this kind of illustrates this picture right here 
in terms of the essence of of, of Calvinism right here. It, it's kind of, to me, it, this picture cap, captures it. If you think about the cross, obviously that's Jesus and salvation. And those at the top of the hill, closer to the cross, represent the humanity that God only chose before the foundation of the world. As you can see, there's a gap, and then those at the bottom of the hill represents the humanity that God didn't choose. In other words, they have no hope. In other words, they, all they can do is just gaze from afar. They have no hope, no hope of salvation. They, they cannot even come near, right? Irresistible grace, they can't even come near. They are eternally damned because God didn't choose them. I need to keep that in mind. So that's, in a sense, Calvinism in its essence. Now, in this message, Corey is not going to bring out Calvinism. He's not bringing out Calvinism in this message here. As I said, this is a friendly kind of critique, but I think there are points or elements of Calvinism embedded in what he's saying. So maybe at the very best, he's maybe a three-point Calvinist because you're going to see he's going to spend a lot of time making points that a Calvinist would make. So with that, let's get into this, his video. And again, I want to do a friendly critique. So Corey Miner, as you can see, um, asked the question, taking credit for salvation. The, the question itself is what you hear a lot of Calvinists say, okay? So it's a smart Christian channel, 166,000 subscribers. So he has a very impressive um, following. And three days ago, this video came out with about 4.6 thousand views. All right, so let's get into it. Sometimes some people may inadvertently take credit for their salvation. In other words, taking credit for what the Lord has done. I want to go to the passage first and then make my point. I'll ask the question too. Who does that? Who 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 is walking around taking credit? Even inadvertently. I I never seen anybody do that. Not not a true believer. All right, here we go. In Hebrews 12 uh, starting verse one, he says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witness surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance or weight and sin, which easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race set before us. Now, obviously, this race is set before us. It is not us, but it is set before us. But the point is this. So verse two, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Notice what he calls him, the author and perfecter of our faith. I want to look at this word again, looking on to Jesus. He is the author, the originator, the one that's beginning our faith. He is the one that starts this. Starts what? Our faith. He also ends it. He perfects it. He completes it. That's what this Greek word here is, telos, which means to end, to perfect, to complete. So he is the one that starts it. He's the one that ends it. So in some way, shape, or fashion, and maybe we don't always quite get it, but he originates it and he completes it. Hmm. Now he says we don't get it. Of course we get it. Let's go back and look at the verse that he that he used. So Hebrews chapter twelve and um, one. I think the the fact that he uses this passage here is problematic because it is not saying what he is saying. He, it, it is not communicating. In other words, to me, he's miscommunicating the passage. So this is. Hebrews chapter 12, and it says, therefore, now stop. So when you see a there, therefore, you have to kind of go back and see what it's there for. He just spent the 11th chapter here, right? And then let me also say this, in order to understand this 11th chapter, you have to kind of understand the theme, the entire theme of the letter to the Hebrews in which Paul is making his case to the Jewish people, one, to turn to Jesus, turn away from trying to offer uh, or trying to get righteous by the law. And so chapter after chapter, you see the writer 
uh, magnifying Jesus as superior to any Old Testament law, where there's angels, Abraham, Melchizedek, the priesthood, everything. Jesus is superior. And then in the 11th chapter, he gives this entire chapter as a list of witnesses of how they please God by their faith. And so when you look at this, um, I'm just going to read the first few verses. He says, now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen for our ancestors. So that would be Jewish people. Our ancestors won God's approval by it, by faith. We understand that the universe was created by God's command so that what is seen has been made from things that are not visible. By faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was approved as a righteous man because God approved his gifts. And even though he is dead, he still speaks through his faith. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not experience death and he was not found. He was not to be found because God took him away for prior to his removal, he was approved since he had pleased God. Now get this, now without faith, it is impossible to please God <clears throat> for the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those that seek him. And he goes on to give notices, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, um, all these people in the Old Testament about faith, Moses, all of these people, right? Uh, and then he says, Barak, Gideon, Jam uh, Samson, Jephna, David, Samuel, the prophets, right? These are people who uh, please God by faith, which is interesting because they please God by faith. I say that because he give, he give, he's going to make a case about faith itself being the gift. In other words, you cannot even believe God has to give you the gift of faith, and then you believe, which then, it's a confusing to me. So then we get to chapter 12. He says, therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us, let us run with race, let us run with endurance, the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was laid before him endured the cross and despised the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, here's the point. What this passage is saying right here is not that God in and of himself. Now, I want to be careful when I say this because, I, because let's look at what scripture is presenting. And Calvinists try to eliminate this whole scenario by saying, well, God is the one who saves you. God is the one that empowers you to be saved. And then they even say that God gives you the gift to be saved, give you the gift of faith to be saved. So that man has absolutely nothing to do with being saved. And this goes back to then sovereign election. Now, <clears throat> of course, as I said before, <coughs> excuse me, I've never seen anyone brag about that they saved themselves. I never seen anybody take credit for having the faith to save themselves. What he is talking about here is how the witnesses, the Old Testament witnesses who obtained righteousness by faith, this is what he's saying is their cloud of witnesses. That as if they were in a court you would say, let's parade these witnesses here and demonstrate that these Old Testament figures <clears throat> got saved not by keeping the law, but by having faith in Jesus. <coughs> excuse me, Jesus. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> All right. Maybe that is telling us that we need to make sure that we're giving proper credit to what is due or to whom is due to. <clears throat> I know there are those who are going to say that I give all the credit to the Lord Jesus, but then in the same breath, turn around and say that they are doing something to keep it, to merit it. 
And they'll say that, no, I'm not boasting, but what does it mean? The Bible tells us that for grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself. Now, some folks are going to focus on the through faith as, yes, see, it's my faith that caused me to be saved. However, when we look at this passage, there's a little bit more to it. And again, I know some people get bothered by it, but again, he gave us these words in Greek first. And I think it's imperative that we understand what's being stated. So let me address, because he loves going to the Greek, as you can see here. Here's the problem with the Greek. If you do not speak Greek, what profit is it? Now, I'm reminded of what Paul said about the, to the Corinthians about them speaking in tongues. If people can't understand what you're saying, he says, what profit is it? He said, I'd rather speak 10,000 words in my native tongue than, I'm sorry, I'd rather speak five words in my native tongue than 10,000 words in other tongues. Right. The point is to, that people can understand. The problem here is, and I want to be careful because, again, I'm not disparaging, in a sense, the Greek language. I'm acknowledging when 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 uh, God inspired the New Testament writers, they wrote their letters in the native language of Greek. The Greek language, the common language of the world. In the Old Testament, it was the Hebrew. Paul spoke both Hebrew and Greek. We benefit from the scholarly work of those who know the Greek, Greek scholars, and then they were able to translate the Bible, translate the language. We benefit from that. I have plenty of Greek study materials and arsenals. I have studied that. If I sometimes want to look up a word, I will look up using the, the Greek. What I will say is, if you just want to understand the plain reading of the scripture, and you don't know the Greek language, I don't know the Greek language. Now, if you look at his screen and you look at the right side of his screen, he has the Greek language, the Greek words wrote out in Greek. What does that mean if you don't understand that? If you can't read and understand, again, Greek language. So this, the left side is the translation, right? It's the translation of the Greek. Again, and I'm not saying that he loves to, to, to engage in the Greek, fine. And that's why he even said that, because people have obviously brought that to his attention about the Greek. He said, well, God gave us uh, the Greek. Well, most of the world don't speak Greek. So what we do need to understand is that the revelation that God gave, right? So you start with the revelation, the revelation that God gave, and then the inspired writers wrote it in Greek. But the wisdom of God was that the, the message, the revelation is universal and thus was and is translated into every language. That's the beauty of it. So my point is, I don't have to know the Greek in order to benefit fully from what Corey is doing here, I would have to know the Greek language. Now they're gonna use Greek participle, henok clauses, and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't make sense if you don't understand Greek. I'll give you one more example, and that is this. Let me go to uh let me go to John chapter three. Many of you know this verse that I'm getting ready to share. It is one of the most popular verses, John 3, 16. And listen, for God so loved the world in this way, he gave his one and only son so that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Now, that's the English translation. If we were to look at Corey's Bible that he has on that right side, if you see this in Greek, how would you benefit from that? unless you understand Greek. But secondly, let me just show you how the English translation is all I need since I don't understand Greek. But when I read this, does this read better in Greek? No, it doesn't. And oftentimes, to properly understand scripture is simply to just read it as it is written. So for example, 
for God loved. Now I can look at the Greek word agape and agapo, agapeo, right? So it's the verb and the noun. Belief and faith are interchangeable. One's a verb, one is a noun. But I could go and look at the word, the Greek word for agape. In fact, in the Greek language, which was one of the most expressive language of all time, no doubt is why God chose it to um, express and give us the New Testament. But there are some 17 different words for our one English translation, love. But here's my point. Context will suffice for God love. So even if I don't understand the different kinds of love, am I confused about this love? Now watch this. Do I think God is saying that it's a friendship love? Or do I think it's a sexual love? No. For God loved the world in this way he gave his only begotten son. And so right there, it is, the translation of the text clearly states it. For he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believed in him would not perish. Let's go back for a moment. Look at that. He gave. So his love was expressed in what he gave. His value was expressed in what he gave. Now, I don't need the Greek to know that. All I need is the Holy Spirit to give me understanding that God loved me in such a way that he gave the very best he could give. He could not give a better gift than Jesus, which tells me what kind of value he placed on me. <clears throat> okay, that's the beauty of this verse. And that's the beauty of just reading the plain reading of the text. All right, so let's go. He says, through faith and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. A couple things. The faith that itself when we look at this, there's a there's a word that we need to focus on over here in the Greek to figure out what actually is the gift and how we know it is, is by this Greek word right here, tuta, which is this pronoun, this demonstrative that speak this, this. Well, what is this referring to? Well, because this is in the neuter, uh, it's, it, it helps us understand what is the gift because the two previous, which is uh, being saved by faith and salvation, they're in two different cases. One is in the masculine, one is in the feminine. But since tuta is in the neuter, then it refers to the proceeding, which means... What the heck is he saying, right? All of this, what he's saying, what the, what the heck is that saying? Okay. It encompasses both. So both of the things are what has been given to us as a gift, our salvation as well as a faith. May not make perfect sense to us trying to it, it makes absolutely no sense to me. But let's go back to the verse here. Let's go to what he's talking about. And that is Ephesians chapter 2. And um, to kind of, to me, show how he is sort of, um, to me, again, misinterpreting the scripture, tripping over, in my opinion, the plain reading of the text. So if... As what he is saying in this verse, let's look down at verse number eight. Um, verse eight says, for you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from God, not, this is not from yourselves. So this is his kind of whole point that your salvation is not of yourself. So you shouldn't be boasting. Then he says, it is a, it is God's gift. Now stop. So now he's trying to say with all of the Greek, that the gift that's referring there is faith. Really? So then, shouldn't this be reflected in the over 90 times the word faith or belief is used, that over 90 times that it is used, that it should reflect that, it, that faith itself is the gift. So in other words, you're just kind of happening along. So this is why I say now, is there some hidden Calvinism here? Because the only way this works, and by the way, Calvinists make this exact very point, that it is not you getting saved by faith, because remember, Calvinists believe that God 
has already made his choice and that limited atonement has already it only it only atoned for those whom God only chose and then irresistible grace is the work that God draws you to that so you have absolutely nothing involved in there in other words so when he says believe no 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 scratch that because he's saying it's a gift but if that's true should not be reflected in everywhere or most places where faith and belief is used let's go back for a moment now and then let's take a look here at verse 5 um and it says it says uh oh, i'll look at verse number four but god like this but god who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us. We already saw that in John 3, 16. He gave his son, right, that whoever believes. Notice he didn't say whoever God has given the faith to believe, right? And then he said, but it made us alive with the Messiah, even though we were dead in trespasses and sins. You are saved by grace. So right here, he doesn't mention faith, does it? He mentioned, see, here's the... The context itself all tell us how he's using the these words and how faith is going to come into play. You're saved by grace. Then he says, together with Christ Jesus, raise us up and seated us in the heavens so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable, immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Then he said, for you are saved by grace. Now he said it again, you are saved by grace faith grace through faith now if we go back and we follow this word faith how in the world will we conclude that the word faith itself is the, is the gift because if faith is the gift then why is there a need to preach the gospel to you because god is already going to give you the he's going god's going to give you all the means to get saved according to calvinism it is god only giving you the the source, the meaning, the gift, everything, which is kind of silly because they have to try to explain this faith because he says you're saved by grace through faith. Well, no, no, no. So, the, so you're saved by grace, but then the gift also is faith. So now, so if you're kind of walking around, God has to give you the gift of faith. That's not how the word is defined either. The, the word is not defined as a gift that I need to be imparted to. God tells me to believe. He says, you believe. Here's what, now, it, he, let me uh, let me go back because uh, I don't want to take too much time lingering here. But, figure this out, but understand, he is the one that's working in us with this faith. We'll come to that in just a second, but you don't want to even be able to boast about the faith that you have to say that I'm saved because of my faith as though your faith is all about you as though you're the one that originated your faith and you're the one that has perfected your faith remember what we just read again who's who's doing that i i don't say again you can to me it's like you're making a point where it's who's doing that who's boasting about their faith who's going around hey my great faith my great faith i'm saved by my great great faith who, who's doing that in Hebrews, he is the beginning, the author of our faith, not just whom we have our faith in. He's more than that. He is the one that perfects it, that starts our faith. He's the one that completes, that ends our faith. That's him. And so going back to this, he says, not as a result of works or ergon, which is ergon, which is you doing it, uh, so that no one may boast. If you're going to turn around and say that it is your faith, that is the reason why you're saved. As though your faith is so great, then what are you doing? You may, in, you may inadvertently be placing uh, the onus on you and taken away from him so that no one can boast for we are his workmanship. In other words, we, we are his. The workmanship, what we have done, what is happening, what we're doing is because and through him created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. There is something that we are to do. And well, let's look at that. And see how it kind of, again, he sort of dis distorts the passage here. So let's go back. Um, 
Let's go back to verse four again. For, for But God who is rich, and by the way, I'm starting at verse four because basically verses one through three declares that we are sinners, okay? We're dead in sins. But then he says, but God who is rich in his mercy because of his great love that he had for us made us alive with, with the Messiah, even though we were dead in trespasses, you are saved by grace, right? Together with Christ Jesus, he also raised us up and seated us in the heavens so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Now, again, after reading this, if you're reading this, who's going to then brag on, oh, look at me, right? Like, like I say, so the, the argument's kind of structured odd because who's doing this? But then the passage, you cannot read the passage and conclude that. And he says, for you are saved by grace. So again, he says this again, you're saved by grace. Then he says, through faith. And this is not from God. It is a gift. And then he says, not from works so that no one can boast. The boasting that Paul is rebuking is from the standpoint of works, not faith. In other words, he says, the reason why you cannot boast about your works is because you are saved by grace through faith. That's his point that he's making. So he's using us to do those things and all of that, all of us being in him is brought about by our faith. Now, I want to look at something. Look at some passages. He tells us to do something. He tells us to circumcise our heart. Problem is, we just don't. As a matter of fact, if we go to Deuteronomy. Well, if you, tell us to, if you tell us to do something, just like, watch this. If he's telling us to do something, again, this is kind of odd that he's going to use an Old Testament scripture. Now, all these scriptures he's getting ready to cite come from the Old Testament. So the idea is that you're going to cite these verses of scriptures from the Old Testament instead of ones from the New Testament. But if he tells us to do something, did he not tell us to believe? So then you're going to say, well, no, 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 because faith is a gift. But he's going to tell us to do that. But then won't he give us the gift to do something? According to the Calvinist doctrine, it is God the one who is working solely in us that we cannot, we do not possess or have the ability to believe at all. Deuteronomy 10, 16, he tells them early on, before they even go take the land, to circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no longer. The issue is they don't do it. The issue is they never do it. It's always been. Well, they do it because of unbelief. By the way, in Deuteronomy, he tells us to seek with things, no, uh, De Deuteronomy 30, where he says, I set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Choose life that you may live. Now, God didn't give them the ability to choose, right? He didn't give them the, the ability to choose, but he said, choose life that you may live. He said, I, I set before you life and death, curses and blessings, but choose life. Nowhere does it even suggest that he said, I'm going to give you the ability now to choose. An issue with man from the garden on man's heart and being obedient have never been where God wants them to. So what is God going to do? He understands that in order for him to be obedient, their heart has to be right. In order for him to trust and believe him, their heart has to be right. They can trust and believe for a day, for a moment, in the midst of circumstances when they're in need. But what about when things are casual, when nothing's really happening, and, and they have a tendency to... Well, he just read the verse in Ephesians 2. They don't do it, even the Old Testament. They don't do it because they're dead in sin. That's why man cannot live right before God. He's dead in sin. Get about him, or when things get hot and heavy, and they want to find other sources, other means to fix whatever issues are. They will have, we will have a tendency to move away. And so God has to fix or remedy the problem. The problem is our heart. So even though he says that for us or for them to circumcise their heart, they never do. So God's remedy is not just waiting on them to fix their heart, to get their heart right. He says, moreover, the Lord your God will 
circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants. So at some point in time, God has made a promise that at some point in time that he is going to circumcise their heart. Not only just the Jews, but he's going to do the same thing with other people. He's not only doing one certain thing in someone's heart with just the Jews and not the Gentiles. No, he's circumcising all of the people's hearts. And notice what he says. This is why this is important. He says in Ezekiel 36, we bring this up a lot because it is important. This speaks of what God is doing. This is why you cannot even think to take credit. He says, I will put my spirit within you. Notice what he's saying. I, God, will put my spirit within you. And then doing what, what will be the result? Cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. If I, God, put my spirit in you, believer, Jew or Gentile, it will, I will cause you to walk in my statutes. And so what you're doing? Now I'm going to split hairs. He's talking to the Jews and he is talking about the work that he's going to do from, to the Jewish nation from their history of rebellion, idolatry. And so the statement here is, I'm going to put my spirit in you. Now, how is he going to do that? How is he going to execute that? Well, this is why we go to the New Testament. In other words, you're making a case here from something where, again, Ezekiel is giving these prophecies as they were being judged because of their sinfulness. Is a result of what he's doing, which is why Paul can make this statement. He says, for I am confident of this very thing that he, that is the Lord, who began that same thing where he says in Hebrews, the author, the beginner, the originator, he who began a good work in you will perfect it. That same word telos is there. He will perfect it until the day of Christ. And so he starts it, he finishes it. He keeps Let's look at that verse of scripture right here, because that is almost uh I'll show you how again he's kind of to make his point, he sort of has to take scriptures out of context. Now here's what I want to say is that there are a lot of other scriptures that he could have used to not do that. Okay, in other words, in other words, to make his point, there's a lot of other scriptures. You don't have to, again, mis uh, take scriptures and, and then just, and this attitude that a lot of people have that, you know, I could just read any verse, any verse and attach whatever meaning I want to it. That That's dangerous because you can make scripture say whatever you want. Black Hebrew Israelites do that. Jehovah's Witnesses do that. A lot of people do that to make their narrative. Now, look at verse, this is uh, Philippians chapter one, and then uh, verse three says, I give thanks to, to my God for every remembrance of you, always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer. Because of your partnership, because, no, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day unto now, I am sure of this, that he who started the good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. He says, it is right for me to think this way about you all because I have you in my heart and you are my partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense of the establishment of the gospel. So Paul was thanking them for their support, okay? Um, and, about, and again, my problem is that we, we shouldn't just extract verses and just attach meanings to them. To make a case, and 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 that's what I'm saying. So you make it. A, he starts with a thought, and as I said, this flirts with a lot of Calvinism to try to make this point that you have nothing to do with your salvation, not even believing that even God gave you faith. The problem with that, and, and again, what's behind that is because God chose you and didn't choose other people. So now you have to then construct these verses and that's what you do you're not pulling verses from here and so he's making the statement well to make his point only god is working in you by the way who is again disputing this but then you're going to say that god tells us to do something but neglect what he is telling us to do in the new testament which is believe which is walk in faith all right it going. How does he do so? Well, because he puts his spirit in your heart and regenerates you. If you want to come back and take credit for that, I think that borders on the line of just something that's offensive. You are not the one 
that has caused yourself to have a brand new heart. You are not the one that caused yourself to be born again. As a matter of fact, Peter says, who Blessed says the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has, look what it says, caused us to be born again. He is the one that's, that's doing this. He causes us to be born again. And ladies and gentlemen, this happens to you. This is not you doing so. This is him doing so. Him causing you to be born again. If it were you that caused yourself to be born again, if it was your decision making, if it was your faith, well, then guess what? Now you've got something to boast about. You've got something to, to, to merit uh, some sort of rewards. You do not. Everything good that's happening in you is because of him. Now, does that mean that there's something that we do? All right. I think that's enough. I'm going to come out now because I think that's that I think we get the point here. And again, in this friendly critique, um, like I say, I I don't know anyone who is doing what he claims that they're doing. I, I just don't know that. I, I haven't seen that. Secondly, as I said, to me, it seems like what it's being flirted with here is kind of riding close to the Calvinist fence because that's what they say. I don't know if they even truly believe all what they're saying, but this idea that, okay, that since God, from the very beginning, so you start with Tulip, remember, and you start with you're totally lost in, in total depravity. That's where he's coming from. In other words, at least, again, this is what it, the hint of it here, that you're because you're in total depravity, you can in no way even believe why you're in total depravity. So it takes God, an act of God, to pull you out of total depravity. It takes God to even give you faith. And that's something that, again, the scripture just doesn't convey. But anyway, that's I'll leave it at that. Like I can say that was just a friendly critique. All right, guys, don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe to BP The Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome. And then I'll see you in the next video.